You can turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37, that's where we'll begin this morning as we come down the, the home stretch here in our series on stewarding life. And this morning we're going to focus on the subject of stewarding our influence. Just like we have been influenced by a lot of other people, our lives will influence countless others. And so this morning we're going to look at the life of Joseph. And we're going to learn from some of the tests that he endured in his life on how to effectively steward our influence to glorify God and to bless others. Uh, because none of us can really know the full extent of our influence until eternity, but most of us assume that our influence is probably smaller than it actually is. We influence a lot of people, um, and many times in our culture, we kind of get hung up on titles, and we may buy into the uh, the faulty premise that, that leadership and influence, that it's related to maybe our position on a flow chart or a title on a door or something like that. But here's a, here's a quote that I'd read. I think this is a good quote. The key to successful leadership today is influence, not authority. And in reality, influence, it reaches uh, farther than, than a title or a position. Uh, many times the truest influence is heart to heart. And when God... When we allow God to enlarge our influence, it'll extend far beyond uh, what we could imagine. I mean, there's people that we think of when we think of influencers. We may think of some prominent influencers. People like the President of the United States, for example, may have prominent influence or the CEO of a company. But it doesn't mean just because they're more prominent that they have significant, more significant influence than we do. Uh, former uh, preacher of the past, Henry Ward Beecher, he said this, the humblest individual exerts some influence, either for good or evil, upon others. In your life, you're going to influence people either for good or for evil. And so this morning, we're going to consider the influence of just one life. And this morning, really think about your sphere of influence the people that you come in contact with, um, and how you influence the people that your life touches. Maybe the most influential person on the planet is a parent. We've spent the last two weeks talking about our families and parenting. Uh, what's the saying that we hear? The, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. You're going to influence your children for a big portion of their formative years. And so if you're a parent, you've got the power to shape and to mold a life. And that's influence. And that's, what we, that's why we spent two weeks talking about the importance that our influence has on our families. And so if you missed those lessons or you want to listen to them again, I'd encourage you to go to our YouTube channel or our church uh, website. And listen to them again. But that's a lasting and significant influence that you have on children. And then who hasn't been influenced by a friend? We're all influenced by friends. Um, as someone's friend, you have direct influence into their life, into their heart. Uh, you have the, the power to affect a friend's thinking or their beliefs. You can stimulate them to action, you can encourage them to direction. And several weeks ago, we talked about stewarding friendship and the importance of that. Teachers, there's somebody who has great influence in our lives. If you are a teacher, and most of us are in some way or another, we're teachers, but you have the power to affect eternity if you think back to your school days, you could probably remember every single teacher that you had. That's influence. That was powerful influence. Um, from kindergarten through high school graduation, every teacher that you came in contact with probably had some sort of impact in your life. 
Henry Adams said, a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. Now, I can think back to, to my kindergarten teacher, Carrie Newfeld, and the impact that she had on my life. And still today, they live in Denver, Colorado, and every time we go out there, we always stop and, and see my kindergarten teacher. It was somebody that was important in my life, one of the earliest people that I knew. Uh, when we moved here for three years, in second, third, and fourth grade, I attended Trinity Christian School up at Bradford. And it's an ACE school, so we didn't necessarily have teachers in the same form from one grade to another, but we had class monitors and, and people that would help us. And every single day, I rode, to, I rode to class from Searcy to Bradford and back every single day with Laura Wilson. And so I spent a lot of time with her, and she was, she was my class monitor. And for three years, you know, I rode with her, and she's, she's one of the people who sparked my interest in music. We listened to Patch the Pirate every single day driving from Searcy to Bradford. And so we would, I mean, she was the first person who ever talked me into singing a solo. And so there's, there was influence that was lasting. And again, I only attended that school for three years, and then from then on I was homeschooled. But the principal of our Christian school, Bill Fees, many people in this room know Bill. And again, I was there in second, third, and fourth grade, but he had such a lasting impact on my life. There's not a single day that goes by that I still do not talk to Bill Fees. I talk to him every single day. Why? Because he made a lasting impact in my life. His influence was great. There's, there's several of us that are former students that every single day we're in a group chat with Bill Feet and we talk about things. And anybody that knows Bill knows that he's one of the smartest people that live on earth. If you have a question, you ask Bill about it. We were, we were constructing that sound booth back there uh, last year. And somehow the subject came up of how, how does a ship ground a wire? And we were kind of talking about that. I said, you know what? I know somebody who could answer that question for two reasons. One, he's just very smart. Second, he spent a lot of time in the Navy, and we learned at school, if you wanted to waste time and get out of doing work, you just asked him anything that had to do with a ship or a submarine, and he'd waste the entire rest of the day talking about it. So I said, I can, I can get the answer. So I called Bill Fees. He picked up the phone. I said, hey, Brother Bill, can you tell me how a ship grounds its wires? And for 30 minutes, he gave us a very detailed lecture on that. I mean, you can ask Bill Fees a question about anything, he knows the answer. But I talked to him every day, and he had an impact in my life. There was a lot of influence. Each of us could probably stop right now and talk about teachers in our lives that we encountered and the impact that they made, how they helped shape our minds. If you serve in the workforce, you have influence that moves in multiple directions. You have the ability to influence your employer, or if you're an employer, you can influence your employees, superiors, peers for good or for evil, as we've already seen. So every single person, whether you're a parent, a teacher, a friend, a worker, just a common everyday person, you have influence in life. And this influence will often reach much farther than we ever realize. Here's a quote from Paul Chappell. He said, one of the greatest threats to our usefulness for God is the myth that our lives don't have the capacity to make a difference. Every, it doesn't matter, again, what your title is, how important you are. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States or you're, or you're a stay-at-home mother. Don't buy into the myth that your life does not have significance and the ability to make a difference an eternal difference as you extend and invest yourself in other people. You may not see the immediate results of your influence, but over time, you'll find out that there was a lot of power through your influence, regardless of what you perceive your level of influence to be. Uh, History is full of unexpected influencers. As you study history, you find out that there's a lot of people who for one reason or another found themselves in a place where they wielded a lot of influence, never expecting to be there. As I was thinking about that the other day, I was thinking about a man by the name of Tom Burnett. There's a man that he was just a common, ordinary, everyday man. Not very, I mean, nobody knew who Tom was. He used to live in Little Rock, Arkansas. 
But the only reason I know who Tom Burnett is is because on September 11, 2001, he found himself on an airplane that was hijacked. And two guys on this flight, Tom Burnett and a man by the name of Todd Beamer, they decided to get together and said, we're going we're gonna to see if we can influence some other people on this airplane to make a difference. And so they took over the plane. They took the hijackers out, and they took control of the airplane. And history remembers Tom Burnett and Todd Beamer because just the short amount of influence that they had, but they rallied a bunch of other people on that airplane and said, we're going to make a difference. And history's full of people like that. And this morning, we're going to kind of consider a little bit of a different story. But one of history's greatest influencers, a man by the name of Joseph, through Genesis 37 to Genesis chapter 50, you can read his biography. And he didn't gain his influence by just kind of climbing the slippery ladder of success or pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. But you can, you can be sure of this. Whenever God gives you influence, Satan will test that influence. And so Joseph's life and his unusual road to prominence, we'll see it this morning. We can chart it by the test that he endured and his victory through them. And in the end, when we get to the end of the life of Joseph, we'll see this morning that his influence was the result of successfully passing some of the most difficult tests in life. And for many of us, we face the same exact test that Joseph faced, maybe in different ways. But the first one we see this morning is the test of persecution that he endured. Persecution. Now, for the Christian, if you're here this morning and you're a child of God, you're a believer, and you love God and you live for God, the Bible tells us that persecution is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. What, is, what does the Bible say in, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12? It tells us that if any will live godly, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So there, you can just mark it down. That doesn't sound fun, it doesn't sound great, but the Bible says anybody who is a believer will face persecution. So how does this start for Joseph? How does the test of persecution start for him? Well, he had a dream. The revelation of Joseph's dream. Uh, now, his motivation was very different than man-made success and a strength outside of himself. God had made a promise to Joseph through this dream. As God reveals this dream to Joseph, God tells Joseph early in his life that he will have significant influence, a place of prominence. And he repeated this dream twice to Joseph, even over his brothers. Now, Joseph was the second to the youngest of, he had ten older brothers. But in these dreams, Joseph finds himself as a very powerful ruler over his older brothers. And his brothers bowing before him. In Genesis chapter 37, we look down at verse number 6. It says that as Joseph is telling his brothers this dream, he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Verse number 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made obeisance to me. They're bowing before him. Now how this young kid with ten older brothers nothing more than just a shepherd, how this guy was going to trade his shepherd's staff for a scepter and have so much influence and so much power, Joseph probably couldn't understand or see, and certainly his brothers didn't. I mean, this is, this is a true, dramatic, rags-to-riches story that we see in the Word of God here. But we're going to see how God works to fulfill this promise. God has made this promise to Joseph. You're going to have great power, great authority, great influence. And now we see how it happens. The testing of his dream. After God reveals it to him, here's where the testing begins. You could, you could call Joseph's family a dysfunctional family. We briefly mentioned Joseph last week in our 
study on stewarding family, we talked about showing favoritism and directly referenced Joseph's father, Jacob. Joseph was the favorite son, and the brothers knew it. They were insanely jealous. These are the ten older half-brothers. They were insanely jealous of Joseph as dad's favorite. And then you add on these revelations of, from God that he's had, and his brothers are just, they're furious with Joseph. Now, I want to take a side note here and just mention that God has revealed this to Joseph through a dream because at this time in history, what did people not have? They didn't have the written word of God, did they? So God spoke to people through dreams. Today, God does not speak to us through dreams because we now have his completed final written word. And so here God is speaking to Joseph through dreams and Joseph shares this dream with his brothers, and things just kind of go downhill from here. I mean, this is where things start to get rough for Joseph. I mean, they've just, they're just, they're steaming. You can, you can just, as you read these words in Scripture, you can almost just, just feel the anger and the rage boiling within these brothers. So they get together and they're like, okay, what can we do? Let's get rid of Joseph somehow. They sent, they're out in the field. Jacob sends Joseph to go check on them. He brings them some food and supplies. They see Joseph coming, and so they plot to kill Joseph. And then they finally think, hey, you know what? Instead of killing the kid, we can make some money off of him. There's a group of, of traders coming through. Let's just sell Joseph as a slave. We'll get the money from it. We'll tell Dad that he died. He'll never know the difference, and we've got the money. Joseph's out of our hair, and everything's good. So they sell him as a slave, and he's headed off to a foreign country. Now, before we advance the story, I want to mention that Joseph's brothers, that their hatred of him, that there were several roots, and these are things that we need to check in our life. Number one, there was envy. They were envious. Verse number four of chapter 37 tells us that when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Verse number 11 tells us that his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same, talking about this dream. So there was envy. We talked about this a few weeks ago, that roots of bitterness in our lives, here we can see results of this. You don't just wake up one day and say, you know what, let's go kill our brother. Let's sell our brother as a slave. That doesn't happen overnight. There's things going on in the background that will lead you to that point. Um, you don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go kill a bunch of people. There's things in our lives that take us to that point. And the Bible teaches us, and Jesus talks about it in the New Testament, that the things that are in our heart, what we think on, what we allow our mind to dwell on, will eventually work itself out through our actions. And we see that the first thing that brought the brothers to this point was envy. Second, there was ridicule. Verse number 19, they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. I mean, they're, they're ridiculing their brother. Now, we're talking about a test of persecution and how we may face this in our lives. And it's not just Joseph. It's woven through all of Scripture and throughout history. You can read of other Christians, other believers who face persecution. Maybe one of the most influential pastors of the 17th spent, uh, century spent years of his ministry in a cold prison cell. Uh, he was jailed for preaching the gospel without the permission of the Church of England. But John Bunyan used that time in prison to write The Pilgrim's Progress, one of the best-selling books of all time next to the Bible. And it's, it's endured for centuries, this book has. We showed The Pilgrim's Progress movie here at church just a few months ago. It's a story that still lives on today that encourages believers. So what enemies of the gospel of John Bunyan, they thought we can persecute this guy, we'll stick him in jail, and we will squash any influence that this preacher has. But rather than putting out all of John Bunyan's persecution, what happened? His persecution is what has led to the influence of millions and millions and millions of people. 
Here's what John Bunyan said about his persecution. Therefore I bind these lies and slanderous accusations to my person as an ornament. He said, I, I, I take this as an ornament. It belongs to my Christian profession to be vilified, slandered, reproached, and reviled. John Bunyan knew what to expect as a believer. And since all this is nothing but that, as God and my conscience testify, I rejoice in being reproached for Christ's sake. He says, I count it a great honor to have this happen to me. Well, that sounds an awful lot like what we read in Scripture from some of the disciples of Jesus Christ, some of the apostles. They counted it a great honor when they were beaten for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was the, the third thing we see? There was envy in their life, there was ridicule in their life, and then there was malice. Verse number 20 of Genesis 37, talking about these brothers and Joseph. How did they get to this point where they hated him so much that they sell him? They say, come now therefore and let us slay him. Let us cast him into some pit and we'll say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what becomes of his dreams. So the test of persecution in Joseph's life, this was severe. Wouldn't you agree? How old is Joseph going through this? He's 17 years old at this point in his life. So imagine being a 17-year-old Facing this kind of trauma, being sold then as a slave, you're headed to a foreign country. After God has just promised Joseph all of this power and all of this influence in his life, you think that at 17 years old you might be confused? Or at 27 or 37 or 57 years old you face that you might be confused? Yeah. So there must have been some rejection that Joseph felt and some pain that his heart felt. I mean, put yourself in Joseph's shoes this morning and see if you can somewhat feel that. But you know what? Joseph resisted the greatest danger in the test of persecution. The temptation to become bitter. Just think for a moment, if Joseph had chosen to become bitter at this point, when this persecution began, he would have failed the test, wouldn't he? The, the dreams that God had given to him, the promises that God had made to him, if Joseph had become bitter at this point and said, you know what, this is just going to eat at me. And we talked about how bitterness will corrode our lives and our hearts and our minds a few weeks ago. God's testing him at this point. We can't let bitterness into our lives because if Joseph would have done that at this point, he would have spent the rest of his life as nothing more than a slave in a foreign country. But because he passed the test, because he handled the test of persecution, he was successful and he listened to God and he obeyed God and he followed God and he refused to get bitter. His life story has a different ending. And his influence continued to expand. We're going to show uh, a documentary here at church in a couple of weeks. And it's going to focus on Joseph. And man, there's some stuff that is mentioned about Joseph that we're going to see that they have discovered through history that my mind was just blown as I learned some of this stuff. I think you're going to be excited when you see this about Joseph. And it will strengthen your faith because history always comes back and proves that the Bible is true. And so we're going to see something here at church in a couple of weeks that I think is going to strengthen your faith. We've been talking about solving Bible difficulties and answering the questions of the critics. There's a lot of questions and criticisms about this man Joseph and about Moses and the validity and the credibility of these first five books of the Bible and the accuracy of these. And if you can't believe Genesis and Exodus and the first five books of the Bible, it kind of destroys the entire rest of the Bible. So it's either... All true or none of it's true. And we're going to see through this even how Joseph's influence is impacting every single person sitting in this room today. And it all goes back to Joseph determining he would not get bitter in his life. And so even as Joseph experienced persecution from his own brothers in your life, don't be surprised. Just mark it down, write this down, 
live by this quote, don't be surprised if your testing comes from those who should be rejoicing with you in the influence God is giving with you. Family members, friends, fellow workers in ministry, many times they are our unexpected persecutors. They may be the ones who question and push us and test us more than anybody else. And you can be sure that Satan wants to use those close people in your life, in your circle, to bring that doubt into your mind. Because if he can get that bitterness stirred up against, well, man, some, you know, somebody in my own family is doing this to me. Somebody in my own church is doing this to me. If you can get bitter like that, he can stop your power of influence. And many times when somebody in your close circle, whether it's family or friends or ministry, church, sometimes it's just the envy of their own hearts that kind of stirs up the contempt or their detraction. I mean, you remember the entire book of Nehemiah is kind of centered around this. Nehemiah, he's, he's got a great job. He's going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He's doing it for the glory of God. And man, who were some of the first people that came and started telling Nehemiah he couldn't do it? I mean, this is other church people, right? Well, Nehemiah, what are you wasting your time for? His biggest, his biggest problem wasn't the people from outside that were coming into attack him. It was the people with this, within his own four walls. So we all deal with that. So what do we do? We encourage ourselves in the Lord. The Bible says that in David, in his times of persecution, encouraged himself in the Lord. And God has a way of turning persecution of his people into a platform of expanded uh, influence. And so Joseph, he could have never become the ruler of Egypt that we know he's going to become. He never could have become uh, the ruler of Egypt directly from the, the sheep fields where he was. That wasn't his path. The path to power and the path to prominence and the path to significant influence in Joseph's life required persecution. So God used the persecution of his brothers to transform that shepherd's staff that Joseph had into a scepter. The greatest danger in the test of persecution is not personal loss because God can turn that loss into blessing. Read the book of Job. Job had great personal loss. But God turned that loss into great blessing for, for, the, for Job, didn't he? The greatest danger is our own bent towards bitterness in life when we go through a test. And so just recognize that when there's ridicule, when there's envy, when there's, when there's detractors in your life, realize that that just is malice in someone else's heart and reject the temptation to become bitter. And years later, you'll be able to see that the platform that God built was formed with those materials of envy and jealousy and malice and hatred and all of those things. God will use that to build the platform that your influence now stands on. Second, we see the test of position. Now that Joseph's there in Egypt, his next uh, test was one of temptation, right? He's the steward for Potiphar. He's the manager of Potiphar's household. This is a... This is a one of Pharaoh's high-ranking officers, and Joseph finds himself in charge of this man's household. Chapter 39, verse number 2 tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. And as you read through this story of Joseph from Genesis 37 to Genesis chapter 50, every time it feels like Joseph is left alone and things get worse for Joseph, you continually find these words, the Lord was with Joseph. Even though Joseph may have been there with nobody else that he knew around him, who was with him? God was still with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So here you have this unbelieving Egyptian man. He senses there's something different about Joseph. Joseph's life reflected something, don't you think, that set him apart from everybody else? Maybe our lives need to do the same thing. People look at our lives and say, hey, the Lord's with that person. God's with him. And so here's this unbelieving Egyptian man. His entire house was blessed just because Joseph was being blessed by God. Potiphar was a smart man. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him 
and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So Joseph is now, he's a slave, he's in a foreign country, but he's got some significant influence over the household of Potiphar. And Potiphar wasn't the only one who noticed Joseph, though, was he? Somebody else noticed Joseph, Potiphar's wife. She sees this sharp young man that, that her husband has purchased, and she now makes it her personal mission to seduce him. So what does Joseph do? Well, first, he ran from temptation. He ran from temptation. This only moral strength from God. This is, Joseph was only able to refuse this, not just once, but repeatedly. Only God could help Joseph through this. And so the situation of temptation, it finally comes to a head here with Potiphar's wife. When she finally, I mean, she physically grabs hold of Joseph. Look at verse number 12. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Joseph just flat out tells her no. And again, he has to say this. As you read here in these verses, it says day by day. I mean, she's continually tempting Joseph over and over and over again. It's been said, uh, opportunity may knock only once, but temptation leans on the doorbell. That's what's happening here for Joseph. And many of us, we can resist the first round of temptation in our lives, whatever that temptation is. Many times we can kind of, we can withstand the first round of temptation. But Satan doesn't just tempt us once, does he? He kind of comes back over and over and over again. You remember in the life of Jesus when when Satan takes Jesus up? He tempts Jesus multiple times, doesn't he? With multiple different things. And how did Jesus, how was he able to withstand the temptation that Satan was offering him? It was with the word of God, wasn't it? It's important in our lives that we have the word of God because when we're faced with temptation in many different forms, your temptation may be different than mine and ours may be different than Joseph's, but Satan will tempt us. He's persistent and he'll try to wear down our defenses. That's why it tells us in the book of 1 Peter that we have to be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because we have an adversary. We have an enemy. Satan, the devil, The Bible says he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says that if we'll submit ourselves to God, we can resist the devil and he'll flee from us. So even as Joseph was promoted to the position of overseer for Potiphar's household and his assets, he resisted temptation. He lived by some moral boundaries, God's moral boundaries. He didn't justify uh, sin. He didn't make any kind of excuses for why it was okay to to, uh, have a breach in his boundaries because of his position. Look at what it says in verse number 8. He refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. Potiphar doesn't even know all the stuff that he has. He just trusts Joseph implicitly to manage his affairs. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, there's the persistence, there's the repeated temptation, he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Joseph's boundary It was a very basic one. He said, I will not be with a woman who is not my wife. There's the boundary. I don't go outside of that boundary. And from the first time Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce him, he made it very clear, I will not do this. And he not only made the boundary known to her, but he made it a point to try to avoid her every chance he could. He believed in having some standards. And because of these standards or these boundaries, these defined parameters in Joseph's life, he was able to preserve his purity. 
Now, in our postmodern culture, boundaries are not popular. And there's even Christians that will scoff at standards and they will call them legalistic. Now, I want to say that there are those who think that they can have some sort of um, arbitrary standards that uh, are just self-righteous. And some people think that because they do holy things, it makes them holy. But Scripture tells us that's not the way it works. When we are holy, we do holy things. But we don't do holy things to make us holy. But when we have some standards, some boundaries that are supported by biblical principles, they're wise and they're vital in our lives. That we make some boundaries and say, here's some things that we're not going to do. Here's some things that we're not going to participate in. Because we're going to protect ourselves. Now, something about prosperity and influence can become intoxicating to people. History shows us this. And the danger comes when we begin to forget who gave us the blessings in our lives. Joseph's experiencing, man, things are starting to go well for Joseph. Joseph, are you going to forget who gave you these blessings? Who's giving you some more influence? Who's promoting you? No, Joseph didn't. But it's at this point that we become vulnerable to temptation. And some people begin to assume, okay, just because I now have some prosperity, because I have some influence, I'm now above the laws. I'm above God's moral standard. Tiger Woods, maybe the greatest golfer to ever play the game, one of the greatest athletes of all time. Off and on, he's been the highest paid athlete in the world from year to year. He clearly draws the connection between his position and temptation a few years ago in his public apology for infidelity in his marriage. I want you to hear what Tiger Woods said. I knew my actions were wrong, but I convinced myself that normal rules didn't apply. I thought I could get away with whatever I wanted to. I felt I had worked hard my entire life and deserved to enjoy all the temptations around me. I felt I was entitled. Thanks to money and fame, I didn't have to go far to find them. I was wrong. I was foolish. I don't get to play by different rules. The same boundaries apply, uh, the same boundaries that apply to everyone apply to me. So when God elevates your position and increases your influence, that's when you have to beware. You have to Take note because temptation won't be far away. Not only did Joseph run from temptation, but he runs with identification. I want you to see this. Uh, he, he tells Potiphar's wife, you know, how can I do this great wickedness against God? Uh, and so we see from his answer, he recognized that to yield to temptation, it would be a crime against God. But from the day that Joseph set his foot in Potiphar's house, the Bible tells us that every single person knew he was a Hebrew servant. Joseph, when he got there, he didn't attempt to kind of blend in. He didn't attempt to try to become some kind of covert influencer. No. Joseph chose to unmistakably identify with God with the God of his forefathers. And this is significant because the Egyptians, they considered the Hebrews so distasteful that they wouldn't even eat with them. In chapter 43, verse 32, the Bible tells us the Egyptians would not eat bread with the Hebrews for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. They despise the Hebrew people. So Joseph goes in and he, he clearly tells people who he is. He doesn't try to hide. He runs with this identification of, I am one of God's people. And because Joseph chose to do that, did it hamper his influence? Did it keep him from having any sort of... No. He actually extended his influence because of this. So when we, in our lives... If we will be continually aware of God's presence and the fact that we're accountable to him, it'll help us to resist sin when temptation comes.
Joseph's victory over moral temptation right here that we see in Scripture. The only reason that he was successful was because he had made some purposeful choices in his life before that temptation got there. Those boundaries that he set. And so we can learn from that. We can set some boundaries in our life and say, you know what, I'm going to install these protective devices in my life right now so that way when I'm faced with temptations down the road, I don't have to try to make a choice at that moment. I already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to identify myself with God because I'm one of His people. I don't have to try to blend in. Many people today believe that the way that we influence people is by shedding our Christian identity. We try to hide the fact that we're Christians and we just kind of infiltrate with them. But the more strongly our identity is connected to God, the greater our influence will be. Wherever you go, doesn't matter the people that you're with, make your identity clear. As a Christian, identify with the Savior. People should know that you're a believer. They should know that you're a Christian. As a married man or woman, identify with your spouse. Let people know that you're married, that you're proud of it. You know, you don't, you don't go to a certain place and take off your ring and hide it. You know, wear it. Be proud that you're married. As a, as a Bible believer, you want to identify with true doctrine. As a bearer of Christ's name, identify with godly friends. The Bible tells us that that's where we find our glory. It's in the cross and our Savior. Number three, the test of problems. We've got to go very quickly through these. Problems, these will kind of reveal a person's character in their life. We see that first Joseph suffered wrongfully. When he rejects Potiphar's wife, she turns the tables and lies. In Genesis 39, verse 19, she says, It came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me that his wrath was kindled. She begins to lie to Potiphar and accuse Joseph of doing exactly what she was doing. She basically claims that Joseph tried to rape her. Well, how do you think Potiphar took that? I mean, he, he, gets, he gets mad. And so Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. Now, even in prison, Joseph began... To realize he was not alone. God was with him even in prison. And God sustained him. And he gave him favor in the sight of the jailer. And Joseph began to work his way up in prison as we know through the scriptures. It says the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him sight, favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So he's, he's wrongfully imprisoned here. So then what does Joseph do? Well next, he waits patiently. This reveals our character. We can see what Joseph's character is through these problems in his life. The Bible doesn't tell us how many years Joseph waited in prison. It was at least two years and possibly 13 years. He was 17 when he was sold into slavery and he was 30 when he was released from prison, but we don't know how long he served uh, in Potiphar's house. So somewhere between two and 13 years, Joseph sits behind the, the prison cell, behind the prison bars. And he finally gets kind of a glimmer of hope because he interprets a dream for the butler, personal's, uh, Pharaoh's personal butler. You remember that? He interprets a dream and he asks the butler, you know, when you get back up there, remember me, speak a word to the king for me. And what happened? Well, he forgot. He forgot. But Joseph kept enduring. He kept waiting patiently during the season of suffering in his life. And finally, one afternoon, just as suddenly as Joseph found himself in prison, he finds himself out of prison. The Bible tells us in chapter 41, verse 14, that Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. To make a long story short, the butler who had early forgot Joseph finally remembers him. And at precisely the right moment, he brings his name up to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And so... Uh, Joseph is called into his presence and by the end of this time Joseph comes in and interprets a couple of dreams for Pharaoh and Joseph goes from within you know, a few minutes he was here in prison 
A few minutes later, he finds himself the second most powerful man in the entire land of Egypt. It's just amazing. It's been said that God's delays are not God's denials. Maybe Joseph thought that God had forgotten those promises that he'd made to him years before, that his power, that his influence would be great. And then all of a sudden he hits this long delay. Years goes by. But Joseph endured through the suffering. He waited patiently. He never gave up. And here he finds himself with great influence. And we see very quickly his test of prosperity. Now things are going good for Joseph. He's the second most powerful man in the land of Egypt. He was blessed by God. Joseph receives great wealth, great power, great influence. The Bible says that Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? He talks about how wise Joseph is. Joseph comes and says, hey, there's going to be a famine in the land. God's given me a plan for how we can make it through. We can store up food. We can survive. We can get through this. Joseph was very, very wise. In fact, there, there's a canal still today in the land of Egypt called the Waterway of Joseph that they believe Joseph invented that diverted water off the Nile River. They funneled it into a big reservoir. They had food. They had water during these years of famine. And so not only was Joseph blessed by God, but then he shared his prosperity. When God blesses us, we're not supposed to then turn around and, and take our prosperity, our gain that we've been given, our power that we've been given, and use it against our enemies. Joseph had some enemies in his life, going all the way back to his brothers. And in fact, Joseph finds himself with an opportunity where he can get even with his brothers, doesn't he? But Joseph does not take that opportunity. He doesn't squander his prosperity on personal grat uh, gratification. He uses it to bless his brothers. His, his family comes down from the land of Israel. They're starving to death. They come down. They don't recognize Joseph. He recognizes them. But Joseph ends up giving them food. Eventually he reveals himself. There's a great reunion. Joseph had an opportunity to get even with some of those people. And he said, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. God used the life of Joseph and his influence. He becomes the second most powerful man in the world at this time. He preserves all of this influence. And he saves his entire family. He saves the nation of Israel, the people of God, because of Joseph and his influence. He passed the test of influence. He chose forgiveness. He chose patience. He chose faith. It's because he was faithful in his life. Many of God's greatest influencers are unknown people. They're unrecognized by the world. But they'll possess one trait, just like Joseph did, the trait of faithfulness. Influence, this is written at the bottom of your lesson. Influence for God is not won by struggle. It's won by faithfulness. In every area of stewardship, God simply requires faithfulness. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. No matter what your position is, what your title is, you have a sphere of influence. Make sure that you're using it faithfully for the glory of God, just like Joseph did. Endure the trials, the tests, the problems, all of those things. Don't give up. Don't get bitter. Allow God to work those tests in your life to continue to grow your influence for him. Lord, thank you so much for this time we've had to study here in the life of Joseph. I pray that you'd help us to recognize that we've been given influence by you. Lord, that we would steward that influence for your glory and for your good and for your honor. Lord, I pray now that you'd prepare our hearts for this morning worship hour. Uh, help us to sing, Lord, this morning from our hearts. Help us to worship you this morning the way that we should. Prepare our minds now to receive the word of God during the preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll take about a five-minute break and meet.